This is Twit. This episode of Tech Break is brought to you by ACI Learning. Join an engaging IT learning community with ACI Learning and IT Pro. Hey, congratulations to Don Pizet, IT Pro's co-founder and original edutainer, and the entire TechNATO team for their 300th podcast. Good going, guys. Get your standard or premium IT Pro membership by using the code TWIT30 at checkout for 30% off. Check out go.acilearning.com slash TWIT to learn more. 50 years ago, the Xerox Alto, this uh, story from IEEE Spectrum, we're still living in the Alto's world. It said the Alto transformed computing. Listen to the lead. I'm sitting in front of a computer looking at its graphical user interface with overlapping windows on a high resolution screen. I interact with the computer by pointing and clicking with a mouse, typing on a keyboard. I'm using a word processor with the core features and functions of Word or Google Docs or LibreOffice's writer, along with an email client that could be mistaken for a simplified version of Apple Mail or Outlook or Thunderbird. This computer runs other software written using object-oriented programming. Its networking capabilities can link me to other computers and high-quality laser printers. You're thinking, so what? My computer has all that too. But the computer he's sitting in front of is a 50-year-old, meticulously restored Xerox Alto at the Computer History Museum. It actually is running. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. I, you I know, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I have to laugh at this because when I was born, uh, I was born in 1980. And when I was born, my my grandfather gave like one of the things he bought for me as an investment was like shares of Xerox <laughs> and had this world gone in a very different direction. It could have been worth <laughs> something. I would have been eaten by now is what I'm saying. You shouldn't have given but, you <laughs> Apple. Yeah, you'd, we'd be eating yeah. you. Yeah. Unfortunately, it did not turn out that way. And that's Who worth knew? a few hundred bucks. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, I'm looking at that article and you know what it makes me think of, Leo? Um, it must have been about 40 years ago, like mid 80s. I read in either Computer Currents or the San Francisco Examiner, there was an article by Dvorak, and he was describing uh, the first Macintosh. And I remember there was some history about the where you know it came from Xerox and so on and so forth. But there was a quote from Dvorak where he said, I don't see these taking off because <laughs> it uses this thing they call the a mouse. mouse. And Poor I don't see John. anyone ever hmm. wanting to use a mouse. You know, you make 100 accurate predictions. You make one <laughs> bad <laughs> prediction. They all remember that. Yeah, he didn't like the mouse. So much. Uh, he was wrong, obviously. Like there, 40 years ago. Yeah. Oof. There's a famous book uh, you should probably read. Maybe, do you still have those shares? Fumbling the Future, <laughs> How Xerox Invented, <laughs> Then Ignored mm. the First Personal Computer. I don't need to rub salt in those wounds, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Alto, I think, was the thing that Steve Jobs saw, saw in a uh, tour yeah. of Xerox Park. Park. He yeah. certainly saw, you know, all of the concepts, the overlapping windows, the mice and stuff, and, and went back. He actually, uh, it's according to Folklore.org, which is uh, Andy Hertzfeld's wonderful site about the early days of Apple, Steve misinterpreted something he saw. He thought he saw overlapping windows, and he went back uh, to uh, the Macintosh team, or I guess it was the Lisa team at the time, and said, they can do it. We should be, uh, we should be doing this. And it turned out that he misunderstood what he was seeing. In fact, they weren't they weren't doing it. But weirdly enough, the amazing talented team, Andy Hertzfeld, Bill Atkinson, did create overlapping windows, even though Xerox didn't do it at the time. They did tiled windows. Mm -hmm. So uh sometimes misinterpreting the future. It's <laughs> maybe even better. Was <laughs> wasn't it just like a glitch, like a screen redraw? Didn't yeah, that, didn't completely clear the screen yeah. or something. Yeah, he's he came away with a completely wrong uh, idea. Uh, so if you enjoy your GUI and your mouse uh, and your laser printers, God, I remember your WYSIWYG the, editor. What, your WYSIWYG editor. You remember when the first <laughs> laser writers came out from Apple? I think they were they were thousands of dollars. They were very expensive. Those mm -hmm. font cartridges. Ah, those, oh, yeah. that's where the money was. Uh -huh. <laughs> they were, those were really, so I remember a friend of mine, Tom Santos, who uh, owned at the time a Macintosh uh, or an Apple store. It wasn't a Macintosh store in uh, San Francisco, Mac Adam. I guess it was a Mac store, Mac Adam. 
had a van with a laser writer in it and would drive around and do portable desktop publishing. He would come to you and you'd say, I want my newsletter to have uh, three fonts. <laughs> he could do it all. What was the speed on Apple Talk? The Apple oh, Talk? I don't I, I know. The, it was very slow. slow. Yeah. Yeah. Very it, slow. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> it was, I think the thing that's interesting is that it, Apple was doing something that wasn't in the mainstream of computing at the time. And so as a result, uh, a lot of the things Apple were doing, it wasn't so much like this is the future. It was like this is a this is like the Amiga. This is over in a corner somewhere, because because you know the the PC came out that was mainstream computing. But I think over time, uh, Apple has kind of I mean shifted the Overton window. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, hugely influential. Obviously, you look at Windows ninety five and the you know. Hard to say that the cues were not taken for the Mac. True. But these things always inform each other, right? Like yeah. they go back and forth. Yeah. Everybody sort of learns from what everybody else is doing and they drive the state. Today, I mean, if you look at the stuff today, despite, you know, I'm a Mac user. I've been a Mac user for 35 years. I've used Windows. I've supported Windows in my previous career as an IT guy. When you get down to it, the details between the two are pretty small in terms of like, yeah, I could go yeah. use a Windows computer. I'm not going to have a problem with it. Like these days, the lingua franca really is all... Yeah pretty universal and it's just the implementation details i think that's absolutely it's not true. a religion it no. really isn't yeah yeah um, by the way p holder in the discord has uh told me that the speed of apple talk was 230.4 kilobits which is actually a lot faster than i thought it was i thought it was like, faster yeah the down in the the 60 or so but all right but you could trust p that holder works. he knows his stuff <laughs> he mm -hmm. knows it. he knows his stuff uh a lot of people thought that jobs stole what he saw at park uh, and and made the Macintosh or the Lisa happen, uh, but I think it's now understood that they licensed it. Right? It was okay. They didn't steal it, uh, but they had some good ideas. And thank goodness because Xerox never did capitalize on the Alto. But here we are, fifty years uh, later, on the fiftieth anniversary of the uh, of the machine that changed everything. Aren't you glad we don't still we're not still sitting at a, a green screen with a blinking cursor on the command line? I don't know. It had a had a charm. I, I kind of <laughs> do it sometimes. I still work in terminal. Yeah. Oh, I love Emacs. So don't, I'm the wrong guy to ask. Yeah, but but we're Mary Joe Foley writes all their articles on Notepad. Notepad. We're very mm -hmm. retro people. We're very retro. Yeah.